Hey everyone. How does my audio sound? I'm getting some reports that can sometimes sound like Darth Vader or something. Can everyone hear me okay? Sound good, Ryan. Great. Okay, then in that case, I'll go back to uh, yeah, thinking quietly for a while. <laughs> Although, as usual, folks are welcome to talk amongst themselves, introduce each other, that kind of thing. Yeah, pretty good and fast turnout this time. Probably have uh, uh, Lynn to thank for that, for this recent uh, popularization of the meetup. It uh, yeah, usually takes a little longer to generate a critical mass. But um, anyway, yeah, so let's all uh, welcome to the meetup. It's six o'clock, but uh, as usual, we'll just wait for a while to give people uh, time to show up. Usually most people aren't around till about five minutes after or so. But uh, in the interim, if people would like to introduce themselves, this is a good time to do so. Um, I can start. So my name's Ryan. Uh, I've been running this meetup and today I'm the speaker. Sometimes other people are speaker. I see Josh is here. Uh, we always need uh, speakers and stuff to talk about. So uh, anyway, uh, yeah, so hopefully most of you already know me, but I'll, I'll leave the floor to other people who want to do uh, to introduce uh, themselves to the group. All right, no one wants to introduce themselves to the group. Uh, that's fine. <laughs> Cool. Yep, more and more people coming. So yeah, waiting a little while is undoubtedly the, the right thing to do. But uh, yeah, for newcomers, anyone who wants to introduce themselves to the group and say hi, certainly can. We're just uh, waiting for people to show up at the usual Zoom, administrivia and all of that. myself. It's just kind of noisy here. Um, I'm Josh. I work at Uber um, and I uh, find category theory useful um, as a framework for thinking about how to map schemes and data between all the different uh, languages and formats that we use. Hi, I'm Well, thanks Josh for that introduction. Uh, would anyone else like to introduce themselves to the group?
I guess not. not uh, yeah. This crowd's a little less uh, social than last month. <laughs> Cool, 30 participants. Probably give it another few minutes. Um, but to use the time, I guess if folks don't really want to introduce themselves, we can also use it for freewheeling general discussion. So uh, yeah, anyone have any questions they're dying to know about category theory or actually just you know topics to be sure to cover today? Also, I should mention, like, I've been muting people who uh, show up as they show up. So anyone who does want to speak will have to unmute themselves. All right, then it'll just be a straight up academic style lecture about monad comprehensions. Uh, yeah, <laughs> nothing wrong with that. Uh, so our intro is still open? Oh, yes, please do. Um, yeah, we want to wait a little while for people to, to show up. So I'm Michael Patrick, and uh, my degree is in geography, which is basically an excuse to study everything on the face of the earth. It's great for people with no attention span. Uh, and my graduate research was in a very large scale online discussions and making sense of in terms of public participation. And in that trajectory, uh, I ran across category theory uh, in uh, oop. <laughs> uh, this is bar wise and information flow. And because I readily, it became readily apparent to me that context was everything. <laughs> and I needed to figure out a way, you know, dealing with like hundreds of thousands, if not millions of posts. Uh, the information is not necessarily contained within the posts, but uh, any snippet of text, any block of text rather was sort of the nexus of vast amounts of context, which really gave meaning to what that particular post was. So I've been attempting to read that book for about 10 years. My mathematical knowledge is not really sufficient. So I just keep beating my head against it. And so that's how I arrived here. I think if I hang around enough, maybe by osmosis, I'll absorb what I need to know. Yeah, category theory is one of those fields where they say it's, uh, yeah, you learn more by osmosis and, and seeing it uh, over and over. Um, Barwise is a great book, although uh, there are easier ones, like uh, David Spivak has a number of books. Steve Audi, spelled A-O-D, has a good book. Um, yeah, I'm sure other people here can, can recommend some as well. But uh, yeah, I feel your pain with regards to data itself and a desire to use category theory to make sense of it, you know. And the case, shocking, uh, my hmm. shocking realization was that old joke about the, you know, Michelangelo carving David out of a block of marble. Somebody walks <laughs> by and says, you know, how do you do that? And he goes, well, I chip away everything that doesn't look like David. And in language, you know, any chunk of language is not only in software, we think of our languages as pointers to concepts and things, but in natural language, it, it, there's an exclusionary function also. It's not only what that thing is, but what that thing isn't. And so the context and in using category theory, I hope will help with that. Cool, okay, well, thanks for the intro. Um, so we probably should get started now. It's been about 30 participants for a few minutes, but did anyone else want to say hi before jumping into the content? All right. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I'll just get straight to it. So um, usually what we do here is our lectures on uh, 
papers from say David Spivak or uh, you know Josh has given a lecture or what have you. Uh, but we've been doing a lot of that. And so the plan for uh, today was to revisit more traditional textbook style material. Um, in particular, what we'll be talking about now is the connection between category theory and functional programming, uh, which goes through both Cartesian closed categories, uh, but uh, also through some things that are more data touching. And by that, I mean things like fold operators, catamorphism, structural recursion to process data, um, and comprehensions as a notation to indicate queries. And so um, it's all related, like today we'll be talking about a particular Cartesian closed category, but the actual focus of the talk will be more data centric about the categorical constructions that are uh, less like higher order functions, but more data processing centric. And so uh, Torsten Grust, um, he's one of the experts in this field. You know, he's not the only one people like Phil Wadler have contributed, but um, I particularly like and am familiar with his work and this paper in particular. So um, anyway, that's the, uh, the background. Any questions before we get started? No. All right, cool. So, um, Right, uh, we'll be talking about monad comprehensions today and people who are familiar with languages such as Haskell uh, will almost certainly be familiar with this. But if you've ever used uh, Scala or if you've ever used say Joss's uh, Dragon system or if you've ever used um, OCaml or anyway, we'll be talking about something that recurs in various languages. So uh, this, Anyways, you read this notation in this paper, keep in your mind that what we're talking about is an exemplar of a family of programming languages for which things like uh, categorical collection processing can be added as opposed to like this one particular language with the particular syntax that is in it. So anyway, with that in mind, uh, here is the fu uh, functional core of a type lambda calculus that we might use for collection processing. So. Uh, this should be very familiar for people who are used to Haskell, uh, but basically um, what we're doing here is defining a uh, programming language. So we're saying that an expression in the programming language we're talking about today, so we're gonna denote those by E, is either a constant, something like zero or one or two, a variable like X, Y, or V, a lambda abstraction. So we're binding the variable. Uh, we have a pattern that matches against the lambda abstraction, and then we have a body. I'll talk about patterns in a bit. Function definitions, right? We want the ability to say things like, you know, uh, addition equals and then give a definition for it. Uh, there are pairs in our language, their language, excuse me. Uh, function application, uh, case statements. So this is like branching if conditional. And so these people should hopefully recognize um, as like core Haskell say, but without the collection processing component, right? You have numbers, lambda abstractions, function definitions, tuples, uh, but that's about it. And so um, what's coming up next is the actual, uh, we're gonna add to this some uh, notions to process data, but let me pause here, um, is the idea that we're, we're defining a lambda calculus uh, that has lambda abstraction and pairing and constants and all of that. Uh, are people okay with that concept? Or rather, yeah. are there any questions uh, on it? I might have interrupted someone. Okay, great. Um, yeah, that sounds like this is probably review for most people, um, you know, how functional programming uh, in the sort of the basics thereof. But uh, okay, what's new here with regards to uh, data or rather what's, uh, where does data get into this? So. Up here above, we have constants, variables, lambda abstractions, all the goodies from functional programming. Um, but what's happening down here with these insertion constructors, empty list, empty bag, and infix operators is how we're actually going to build uh, our data itself. And so um, today we're going to talk, be talking about something called insert presentation uh, on lists, on bags, on sets. But basically the idea is you have an empty list in your language, that's the empty brackets, or you can have an empty bag which is like a multi-set, it's uh, a list, but or, uh, it's a set, but for which you have multiplicities, or you can have the empty set, which is just these little brackets. Uh, and so there's gonna be three types of collection that we talk about today 
lists, bags, and sets. But one of the cool parts about category theory is that we can generalize to other collection types besides uh, just these. Um, there's another bit here called the insertion constructor. So, you know, I mentioned empty list, empty bag, but, you know, you, the way you would get uh, a list is to insert an element into the empty list, right? So there's also, um, and we'll see this later, uh, operations in this language for consing an element onto a list, for example. Uh, that's what this up constructor means. Um, the notions of pattern matching, uh, I'm going to ignore in the sense that it'll be self-explanatory when we see a lambda abstraction, like what its meaning is in this paper. Uh, the reason being that in data processing, we typically see less higher order functions uh, just because you know, it can be quite costly to create a closure with like a terabyte of data in it and that type of stuff. So um, anyway, let's move on to some uh, examples because that will make this syntax uh, clearer. Oh, and obviously I, I of course should mention the types here, right? So we have a, a Lambda calculus, but it wouldn't be uh, complete without a, a type system, right? We wouldn't want to say like, you know, apply the number three to the number three, that wouldn't make uh, any sense. So um, each expression in the language is associated with a type, either a natural number, or Boolean, or a string. There are type variables to allow polymorphism, but we can ignore that. Um, anyway, there'll be function types, pair types, and then of course, list types, bag types, and set types. So uh, this too is exactly what uh, we would expect from a language like Haskell. And then finally, before getting to the examples, let me just say what the, uh, the give the notation for the construction of collections. So earlier I, I mentioned the little empty brackets uh, for empty list, empty bag, uh, and empty set. And then we said there's, uh, we can insert um, an element into each type of collection. So um, anyway, this, this notation here is just defining what uh, union means for each of these data types. So anyway, if you see uh, the, this double plus symbol here, that means two lists appended to each other. If you see the U with a plus in it, that means two bags union together, but where we, we count their multiplicities uh, twice, right? And then this U here just means, you know, regular union. Uh, and so, yeah, anyway, the, uh, if you see these symbols just be aware, you know, we're dealing with three different collection types, lists, bags, and sets, and then these will be the notation uh, for the union operations on each. The little up arrow means, you know, append X to a collection uh, X's of them. So anyway, this will probably make more sense with um, an example. So um, here we go. And I'll pause after this to take questions. But um, in this talk, if we wanted to indicate a bag, which is to say a set, but with multiplicity, whose elements are x0, x1, all the way through xn, um, then here's how we would, like in the notation we described above, right, we end, what we're doing is we're saying, you know, apply uh, one element const onto another list and all the way down until we get to this empty list. So uh, I'll pause here. This is just some syntax, but, uh, Hopefully it's intuitive. Um, if not, this is a yeah, good good place to pause and, and take or, uh, everyone get get everyone uh, on the same page. So questions so far. Hey there, I have a question. Can you explain sure. again what's the difference between a bag and a set? Yes, good question. And in fact, maybe there's uh, an example. Oops, I'm going the wrong way. Later on, that shows uh, the difference between a bag and a set. But basically, so you, you know what a list is, right? Just a um, sequence of values for which the order matters. A bag is what you get when you throw away the ordering constraint, but you still care about how many uh, copies of an item are in your collection, right? So, um, it, uh, you could think of a bag as a function from a set to a natural number, or uh, you could think of a bag as a list considered up to permutation. Uh, but yeah, it's a collection of elements that has multiplicity, but no ordering. Does that help? Yeah, got it. Thanks. Cool. Okay. And then, right, a set has neither multiplicity nor um, an ordering. And yeah. Okay. Other questions?
Okay, cool. So uh, in that case, we can move on to uh, the rest. So spine transformation. So basically the, the idea here is that we have a notation for data that consists of an empty collection and then like a sequence of elements connected by uh, either you know list concat list appending or bag appending or uh, set appending, and so the idea is that we want to structure data transformation as transformations of collections in this like spine form, right? And so we're going to use the the primitives like lambda abstraction, function application, and all of that uh, to actually define transformations on these spine looking things, and so. Right, uh, this is basically how to use spine transformation uh, for data processing. And so here's uh, an example of how this works, um, which we will then drill into because there's, uh, or maybe the way to say it is, this defines semantically a function maximum that will drill into some other defini definitions of it. This is just, uh, by semantically, I mean, it's sort of the shortest possible uh, definition. So. Anyway, suppose we had a, uh, let's see, this is a bag of natural numbers. Uh, let's call it XS, uh, Xs, I guess. And uh, what we want to do is figure out uh, the maximum in it. And so we'll assume that we have available to us a function max, a function or a constant called negative infinity. Uh, but anyway, the, the thing to note is how we would write this definition um, in a, a Haskell-like style, right? So we know that the input is a bag of natural numbers, we'll call that X's, and so we do a case analysis on that bag. If the bag is empty, right, so if X's consists of the empty thing, then we'll say that the maximum of this bag uh, is negative infinity. So uh, yeah, for the purposes of this paper, uh, negative infinity is a natural number. That could be zero or whatever if you'd like. And then the other case is what to do when the bag is made up of a head element and then some other elements. So here we'll call the head X and the other elements, which is itself a bag appended onto X, right? We'll call that XS prime. And so this recursive definition says that the maximum for this recursive case when we have X and another bag is the actual maximum of that element, right? The natural number in the list and the maximum of uh, the rest of the bag. And so I'll pause here, but hopefully this is Haskell-ish looking enough that um, people with a functional programming background are not totally lost. Uh, comments here? Questions? If, if you're doing the spine trans, transformations, there seems to be a gap between uh, bag and set, which is basically the ordered bag Oh yeah, there's a lot of uh, yeah. There's a there are 15 missing collections here, or some number. Oh. Uh, yeah, it's called the, there, there's something called the boom hierarchy. And so if you uh, yeah, uh, sorry, this is a tangent, but I, I can't uh, I can't resist. Although I'm gonna go mute just to get noise off the line. Yeah. So the boom hierarchy. So you're correct in noticing that there's more than one collection in play, and uh, we're missing some and we're missing uh, the various combinations of associativity, commutativity, idempotence of the, the union operator. So basically you can work out all the different combinations of does order matter, does multiplicity matter, what have you. You end up with a giant lattice of data types. There's some number of them, I forget what it is. It's called the boom hierarchy, but it's like 20 or something. And then yeah, this paper is only about uh, three of them, but it, in principle, it works for all of them. So uh, hopefully that answers your question. Um, yeah, sorry to, to mute people like that. Are there other questions, comments? Okay, cool. Okay, so the, the what's going to happen here is that um, we noticed that this is a recursive definition which means that um, uh, it may be easy for us to write this way, but this isn't necessarily the most direct way to get a computer to figure out like, how can I parallelize this maximum function, for example, or how can I uh, reason about it? And so we're going to see uh, 
other definitions that are written slightly differently, but uh, do the same thing. And in particular, uh, what we're going to try to do is rather than think of having a recursive definition, what we want to think of is that maximum isn't a recursive function. I mean, it is, but the point to notice is that it, it's, we can specify what it's doing as replacing the, uh, the appending operations of the, the data structure that we're processing, right? So another way to think of how maximum is defined is it is the function that just replaces the, the append operation with a maximum operation like this. Uh, that uh, and you can see it here, right? Max is a, it's an, it takes two arguments, right? Two numbers. And so, right, what we're saying is we have the, the maximum of X zero and the maximum of X one and, and all together that you can just think of replacing uh, the spine here with a particular operation and you can define maximum that way uh, rather than giving this kind of recursive definition. So. I'll pause there. Does that idea make sense that we're going to replace the, the spines of our bags, lists, and sets with other operations drawn from what are called other algebras uh, to do our processing? Yep. Okay, cool. Right, so this idea that if we have a collection um, arranged into a spine and can replace the individual, uh, I guess we call them junction points or whatever these uh, these arrows are. Uh, this has a name in category theory and in, in functional programming. Um, actually, it has many names, but uh, the I guess you call the proper categorical name is the idea of a catamorphism. So that's what we would we wouldn't call it a spine transformer in category theory. We would call it a catamorphism. But uh, people who have programmed in Haskell probably recognize fold. Um, in some languages, this operation is called reduce. Uh, it has many names, but the idea going forward is that rather than write like a recursive style definition as we were doing before, uh, we're instead just going to say what we want to replace the empty set, empty bag, empty list with. And we're just gonna say what we wanna replace the, the, the construction, you know, list append, bag append, set append, uh, we want to replace those with something else. So um, the notation here is just if you have a collection, right, x0 through xn, uh, you just say these are called banana brackets. Um, here are banana brackets, and z is going to be, be the stand in for my empty collection. And then this times will be the operation that stands in for the spine transformation, right? And so um, this is a very compact notation, but it's it's equivalent, or rather each recursive definition in the form we had before can be written in this style, right? And you can see it directly up here where, um, right, we would say that the empty case goes to Z and the recursive case gets combined with the O. And anyway, this is exactly the action um, on the, on the, the data type. So I'll pause there as the idea of a catamorphism clear. Okay. Um, so just to work through it um, in detail, right, what is the type signature? So if we have, for example, a list of alphas going in, and we're going to be returning a beta, then we have to uh, specify the zero element, right, the empty one, that's Z, so that should also be a beta, right? And then the operation that's combining the intermediate elements uh, should have type alpha times beta into beta, right? It has to take an element in the list bag or set that we're processing and one of the new results of type beta that we have and return yet another beta. And when you work this out, you find right in the example we did before with maximum, you set Z to be negative infinity or zero, whatever you want. Uh, right, and then you set this times to be, uh, this O times operation to be uh, the maximum, and then that's exactly what this is, as I say here. Maximum is banana brackets, uh, negative infinity, maximum. So um, that's 
banana brackets. And if anyone's seen the famous paper functional programming with uh, bananas, lenses, and barbed wire, that's where the bananas uh, meme, if you will, comes from. Uh, pause there. Any questions on that? Cool. Any comments on the presentation or anything like that? Uh, anything folks want to see but haven't or vice versa? All right, onward and upward. So, um, right, there are other names for what we're calling catamorphisms and folds here. Uh, if anyone's heard the term homomorphism, that's another exemplar. Um, there's some other algebraic and uh, uh, there's other algebra going on here. We could talk about how, you know, there's uh, we're dealing with monoids and, and stuff like that, but. I think the, the takeaway for this talk is just that um, with just fold alone, you can do like a lot of cool stuff. Uh, you can take, you know, the maximum of a collection, the minimum, you can do or of a Boolean list bagger set, you can do and, um, you know, there's all kinds of, of stuff you can do. Um, in fact, catamorphisms are um, in a language that has both lambda abstraction and products uh, are equivalent to primitive recursion. And so literally any primitive recursive function that you could write um, on a list bagger set can be written um, as a single catamorphism. Uh, which brings us to the next topic, which is, you know, why would we want to program in this style and, and what do we gain, right? Like if I'm programming in Haskell, why would I want to use fold as opposed to writing my own? Um, and that gets into how you can optimize and efficiently execute uh, programs that are written in this style. And so, uh, in fact, catamorphisms fuse, which is to say that uh, you can take two recursion through two traversals through a list uh, and um, zip's not the right word, uh, combine them so that uh, you only need one traversal. So I'm trying to find the uh, example of that, uh, ah, one, two, uh, example one, two. So this is a little hard to read because uh, it relies on, um, man, do you think there'd be a better direct statement of uh, how to fuse catamorphisms here? Um, that's okay, we can just walk through the example um, he gave. So uh, let's see. Or rather, uh, yeah. I'm going to stop share, break out the notepad, and then drop back in just because I want to give a better. Oh gosh, and there's 24 things in the chat window. <laughs> uh, sorry, let me bring up the screen again. Okay, right. So here, here's uh, the, the point I wanted to make about uh, these, these banana brackets and such. So if you have, um, or rather, here's the, the claim I want to make, that if you have two of these folds together, right, and let's ignore just the, the zero for a moment. Like if I just have two spine traversals, Right, it should be in some sense obvious that uh, I can just traverse the collection once, but at each uh, element that I process, I can apply both uh, both of the the operations in order. Right. So, for example, um, like if I were, uh, what's in it? Uh, well, maybe I'll just leave it there. Uh, when you write programs like this as folds. You can usually take two folds and turn them into one fold by taking the operation that you're doing, um, composing it, and then using that as the operation uh, to use inside of the fold. Um, Russ wrote like the technical, uh, you know, what the lemma actually looks out looks like, which is a little hard to write because we have to worry about like the, the different zero elements and stuff like that. But anyway, that's the the basic idea is that we write things. Uh, in the fold style so that 
uh, an optimizer can come along and uh, optimize them later using a law uh, such as this one. And in the limit, we can actually just traverse structures once, um, which uh, actually shows a limitation of uh, the ability of catamorphisms to do things like grouping and aggregation. But anyway, that's uh, another topic. So let me pause there again, especially since I noticed there were, there were folks in the chat room are there any questions here or lingering questions um, to address before moving on? The next topic is how comprehensions uh, look like queries and desugar into these folds. Okay, cool. So, uh, right. So, so far, what have we seen? We've seen that um, there's a prototypical functional programming language uh, that we can embed lists, bags, and sets inside of it and process them using folds, which are also called catamorphisms. And we're in a, a situation that looks a lot like Haskell. Um, and now what I'd like to show you is how that extends even more, right? There is in Haskell or in other languages, the notion of a monad comprehension which is actually defined in terms of uh, the catamorphisms and list processing stuff that I just showed you. Uh, so what's next is um, an, another, user, uh, another syntax, more user facing, that looks like a query language that we will then show how to translate into catamorphisms. And uh, that process taken together is a prototypical query compiler. So uh, with that in mind, I'll start on Ronan comprehensions, but are there any questions in the interim? Okay, I have a quick question. I, sure. Uh, so you made a statement earlier. Um, I posted it in the chat window. I didn't want to interrupt and didn't quite catch it. You seem to have made the claim that uh, catamorphisms are uh, equivalent to the typed Y combinator. Is that what is that what you said? Uh, uh, no, the, yeah, primitive recursion, not general recursion. So you, you can't okay. use a, right. And that only holds in a circumstance where you have uh, Cartesian closure. If you don't, then you need something called a paramorphism to get all the primitive recursive ones. Okay, makes sense. There's also something called um, an anamorphism. And so uh, that's not, we won't talk about it in this talk, but there's essentially an unfold that lets you create one of these data structures rather than consume one. Uh, so all these things have duals in there too. You don't get general recursion, you just get uh, the dual to, but anyway, uh, good question. Are there others? Guess not. Okay, cool. So then uh, monad comprehensions. So uh, in my experience, these are actually easier to see by example than by uh, syntax. Um, the reason just being that the syntax looks like the kind of stuff we write at a whiteboard and the, the actual syntax, like it, it's almost degenerate. So any, without further ado, what do these look like? So basically all we're going to do is say, I, I want the set of like some things such that uh, a bunch of properties hold as I loop through another set. So um, what does this look like? So uh, here are some examples. Suppose I had a function f and I wanted to map it through a bag. That is, I have a bag and I just want to uh, apply the function f to each element in the bag. Uh, and then my new bag should just be the image of the old bag through the function f. Uh, you would write that like this, right? I want all of the f applied to x's such that x is drawn from the x's. So this is a symbol we haven't seen before, the little left arrow it's what's new in the notation, right? The notation says start with a bracket, give an expression, write a vertical line, uh, and then you have a sequence of these, these bindings, right? Bind, all, bind each x's into x, for example. So um, hopefully the notation's intuitive. Here's another one. Um, if I had a list of lists, or actually in this case, excuse me, it's a set of sets, how could I flatten that uh, into just one set? Well. You could say, give me the set of X's such that X uh, comes from, or sorry, give me the, I have to read these left to right. So starting from the set of sets, give me all of the sets, we'll call that XS, and then given XS, 
give me each element in the X, and then I want the set of all of those X's. So that's, that's a flattening uh, operation written in this notation. Um, I'll pause there and also check the, the channel. Any questions on this, this notation so far? Okay, Oops, too far. So, um, yeah, comprehension notation, something we all know and love. Um, what does it have to do with monads? So, uh, here we've just sort of been assuming that given we know what a list is and a bag is and a set is, that we know how to interpret this notation, right? We That it, it's uh, something we're, we're assuming because we know what lists are and we know what bags are and we know what sets are. Um, the reason it's related to monads is that if we had a different collection type that was described just as a monad, uh, we could use this too. So in particular, it is uh, this binding operation for those who are familiar with Haskell would literally be a monadic bind. Um, and then uh, the return operation uh, shows up as a, a singleton former, right? And then um, you also need a monadic zero to interpret the empty set. So even though we're just talking about list bags and sets in this paper, uh, this notation actually works for arbitrary collections that can be defined as monads. Uh, and that's where the, the monad comprehension calculus name comes from. But we like to do list bags and sets to keep things uh, concrete. So um, anyway, with that uh, little rant out of the way, um, here are some examples. So, um, and there are examples that show why we like this notation in the sense that the notation is widespread in other languages, right? So those of you familiar with SQL uh, probably recognize, you know, select from where queries. And so those correspond directly to uh, expressions in this comprehension syntax. Um, they're a little, uh, I don't use this as a definition um, in the sense we haven't really you know, defined what's inside R or S or P or anything like that. But uh, basically this comprehension notation, it was, it was designed originally to replicate, you know, select from where queries. So uh, it's not unexpected that it would show up in query processing, um, I guess is the, where I'll leave that one. So, um, Right, for those who want to see how this relates to monads, uh, this is literally the, the actual uh, direct translation. Um, I'd say it's not too interesting, but I'll walk through it and then pause for questions again. So basically what it's saying is that, um, you know, you, you assume you have uh, the unit operation of the monad, the map operation, and here um, Rust is using the, the join rather than the bind, but it literally just shows you how to desugar the comprehension notation um, into the, the primitive. And so uh, actually, if you look inside the GHC compiler, uh, you will see this translation as well, uh, the translation of the comprehensions um, into the monadic syntax, um, just like this. Hopefully, yeah, it should be, people should, who are familiar with Haskell should be seeing do notation um, everywhere in all of this. But uh, with that, I'll pause, any questions? Okay, we'll keep going. And uh, as a lecturing from a paper is, I guess, a good example of um, yeah, why, why slides and papers are different, uh, different mediums. But um, anyway, here's uh, literally an example of how of how uh, this translation might work. I don't think the the details are important in that, um, where like it's clear that the the top level here is sort of the most uh, natural way to write this thing, right? If I want to filter some X's by P, uh, just give me all of the X's drawn from XS such that P of X is true of them, right? So this is even shorter, like character wise, maybe than the thing on the left, but when you desugar it into the monadic primitives with join and map and all of that, uh, it gets much bigger, but um, that is technically where, where things end up. Um, and then of course, once they're in this form, we can use the usual uh, equations of monads to, to optimize them. 
but um, let's see some examples though, since um, you know, we've built up this syntax, but uh, how does it relate to, to query processing? So, um, right, let's see. Oh man. Um, yeah, maybe let's not walk through that example because it's uh, kind of deep, but we can walk through this unnesting example, uh, which I particularly like because um, it corresponds to something that Haskell is doing, which is that Haskell will also put monad comprehensions into a particular uh, normal form before uh, further processing. So, okay, what does this example uh, look like? Um, I'll return to this, but we'll, we'll get to the example uh, first. So what we're, or what I want to, to bring to people's attention here is the idea that we can take nested comprehensions and flatten them out, right? That um, if you think of monad comprehensions as being uh, select from where types of queries, that the monad laws themselves give us the ability to merge queries from nested to flattened forms. So anyway, what I mean by that is a, for example, a select inside of a, that has a select within it, um, this type of, of nesting. So that's what this example is gonna go into, like from clauses nested within from clauses, uh, that type of stuff, which has traditionally been difficult for query optimizers to do. Um, I would speculate because you know, they weren't thinking about monad laws uh, in particular to do the optimization. Um, anyway, uh, to, to make things concrete again, there are laws about uh, the monad comprehension syntax, uh, right? Laws that say things like, okay, no matter what comprehension you're evaluating, uh, if you have the empty list or bag or set inside of it, then the result is going to be empty. Right, there's laws like that, uh, but there's also just the associativity laws and the regular laws from monads that you would expect from Haskell. And so when we apply those laws um, to a nested comprehension, uh, we find that the nesting actually disappears, right? So if you look at this example, um, you know, here's how we eliminate a singleton uh, co or a collection, right? Here's how if we have a collection um, right, that we're looping through and placing into V, how we would remove that nested collection, right? There's two occurrences of brackets on the left, but only one occurrence of brackets on the right, right? So the number of brackets here is decreasing as we move from left to right. And so that's uh, not a fact I think most people realize about how uh, Haskell monad comprehensions will get normalized, but it happens to be a great thing uh, in a query optimizer, because each one of these nestings corresponds to a nested subquery uh, it, for which, uh, you know, when you have uh, big data is problematic. So anyway, what is the takeaway of all this? And then I will, I will pause uh, for questions. The takeaway is that if you have any comprehension possibly nested, you can use the rules in this paper, which are derived from the category theoretic formalization of this paper, to put them into a normal form that is flat, uh, that looks like this, uh, which is a good point for further processing, optimization, and what have you. So monad comprehensions have a normal form that is flat, uh, and we like them for that reason because that's a great starting point for a query optimizer. Questions so far? Um, I think that's a, yeah, probably a, a sign that um, these slides are, uh, or rather this paper is not appropriate for slides. But uh, anyway, what are some of these examples? Um, what do these look like in a pure SQL setting? So uh, of course you can take an SQL query, translate it into the formalism in this paper, and then translate from the formalism in this paper back to SQL uh, sometimes. Um, and so what do these, um, what do these types of optimizations look like in a pure SQL setting? Um, they, uh, I guess they don't look surprising, but they are written out here uh, for anyone who's curious, right? So there's so many 
papers and Oracle spend so much money on like, okay, what if somebody writes a query that's literally this exact form where, you know, we can find that there's a, a subquery of exactly this kind. And um, right, the claim in this paper is that if you use the formalism in it, you don't have to do this case by case analysis. You just convert everything to monad comprehensions, uh, unnest everything, and then either convert back to SQL or translate to, to catamorphisms and execute yourself. So anyway, this is what um, that style of optimization that we just see, like what it looks like uh, when you do it on pure SQL. But uh, there's, it turns out this technique is actually more general than your typical SQL query optimizer. So um, there's, you know, a bazillion of these examples, but in all cases, what's going on is we're taking a query, converting it to monad comprehensions, normalizing the monad comprehensions, and then magically end up with a, a query that's either directly faster or easier uh, for a query optimizer uh, to get started on. And it's very difficult to do that without going through the category theory, which is not to say people haven't tried or, or done it, but um, right. So, okay, um, that is, that set of optimizations and actually the rest of the material I had planned uh, was for, uh, or rather just elaborations on um, this kind of stuff. But um, what I do have uh, for the rest of the lecture is um, I have a, a um, implementation of this formalism in a way that makes the connection to category theory like totally direct. So uh, for the last 15 minutes of the talk, I think I'd like to switch gears and show the literal connection between, for example, this syntax and the categorical constructions by switching to a different paper. Uh, so let me pause there. Are there any questions, comment on uh, monad comprehensions as defined by Torsten Grust? Can I just ask, are the optimization opportunities that you're describing at all dependent on the operational semantics of the programming language? Uh, no, or at least not if they're, if we're working in a language without side effects, right? So no divergence or anything like that, then they wouldn't depend on it. Um, the kind of optimization that does depend on, uh, let's say the data you have at hand is, is called semantic optimization. But uh, yeah, none of these techniques are uh, particular about either the data or the, the built-in primitives. Uh, did that answer your question? I think so, thanks. Sure, other questions? Cool. Okay, so then um, I'll move on to uh, another paper, which is not slides, but which is uh, more categorical um, in Outlook. And then hopefully we can uh, map it back onto uh, what we just saw. And also people are almost, anyone who's worked with uh, Josh at Uber on Dragon, for example, is likely to have seen um, this syntax and such before. So, um, right. Uh, so to restate what we just saw, here is a, an alternative presentation of the formalism uh, presented by me instead of Grust um, with a guy with an eye more towards uh, connecting it to category theory than showing query optimization. But as before, we have some base types like integer, uh, I guess probably throw bool in here. Um, in the way I've set things up, in addition to products types, uh, we have uh, excuse me, we don't have bags and sets, we just have lists, but we do have uh, infinite streams. So that's one way in which this is distinct from rests. But as before, we have product types, function types, uh, some types, empty type, unit type, list type. And the expressions are uh, written in a different syntax than his, but they are the same, uh, or rather they are the same uh, semantically are the same operations. So actually what I want to show is the lambda calculus form of this first, uh, not the right. So yeah, this is the, this is what would look um, most direct to what uh, Grust was showing, right? So um, yeah, typing rules. Uh, if we have, for example, um, E of type T 
and f of type t in a context gamma, you know, just some variables, then, you know, equal ef is a Boolean, right? So um, anyway, same calculus that uh, Rust was showing, but what I want to present um, is not this like lambda calculus looking form like he showed, right? Because he had variables and lambda abstractions and such. What I want to show is the categorical form, which should be, uh, it, it is related, but hopefully looks similar enough that the connection um, is direct. So I'll pause there and, and walk through the syntax, but um, any, any questions so far? Okay, right. So how does all this stuff connect to category theory? So I'm going to show a grammar essentially that corresponds to the internal grammar of um, a bicartesian closed category with uh, least and greatest fixed points of polynomial endofunctors. So that's a mouthful, but the point I want to make here is that in this phrasing of what you just saw, it's, is, uh, more di it's directly categorical in the following sense, right? So we're going to build a, a category where uh, the types, or sorry, the objects are actually types, right? So we'll have an object called int, an object called zero, an object called one. Um, and I'm just assuming here people know what categories are, although we can define them. Um, but right, we're going to have infinitely many categories, right? We'll have int and then we'll have int times int, right? And int arrow int and list of int and list of list of int. And all of these are gonna form the objects uh, in a category. And then the morphisms in the category are going to be uh, essentially the, not directly programs in the, the formalism that Rust had because that has you know variables running around and, and all of that, but um, it, it's going to be expressions built from this language here that hopefully the uh, connection to Grust's language is clear, right? So whereas in the Grust paper, we might say, okay, I, I have some expression E and now I apply first to it. In this categorical formulation, what we have instead is just a morphism called first that has an input type of t times t prime and returns a t, right? It projects out uh, the first element. And so basically there is uh, a correspondence between this formalism here that um, you see in APG and in this paper and some others in the math papers and the lambda calculus form that you see in Grust's uh, paper that's more directly connected uh, to Haskell. So anyway, uh, that's, Basically, the yeah, sort of the point I wanted to make, um, you know, bring everything back down to category theory. So I uh, won't bore people with the with the details, but um, there is, uh, yeah, an axiomatic semantics um, associated to this that you take all the expressions you can write in this language, uh, you quotient out by a bunch of equivalences and you get a nice pretty Cartesian closed category that corresponds exactly to what, uh, what Grust was doing. So anyway, that was a bit of a ramble and a kind of an anticlimactic ending, but um, I did want people to see uh, what, it, what Grust language looks like directly in its categorical form. And the answer is it looks like these combinators for what it's worth. So uh, I'll pause there, take uh, questions. Is there any Corresponding category for terms in the types. Corresponding category for uh, what? Can you repeat? Terms. Terms in the type. Corresponding for. Uh, so I, I'm not sure I still heard what you say. I got the is there a corresponding category and then something about types, but I didn't quite get. Uh, yeah, can you just repeat one more time? The expressions that are in the type. Oh, expressions in the type. So um, this is not a dependently typed language. What's happening is that each expression, each morphism is going to be typed according to this language of types. So this abbreviates a collection of objects in a category, right? And then the expressions we have down here will always be morphisms from one object to another, right? So 
for each object T, for example, we have a morphism called the identity uh, that goes from the T object back to the T object. And then, right, like down in our semantics, right, we have rules that say, if you compose the identity with anything, it's like just having the original thing. So um, this is a typed formalism, uh, but it is not a uh, dependent formalism in the sense that the types do not depend on terms, only the, the terms, only the morphisms depend on the types. Does that answer your oh, question? Oh yeah, I, I didn't mean dependent types. I mean that these types are classifying some lambda expressions, right? So is there a corresponding category for these lambda expressions? Oh, right, so these, t um, yeah, so for example, here's the function type constructor, right? Here's the product type constructor. So the actual lambda here, and maybe that's what you're asking, is uh, is this. And so it's it's actually called curry, right? And so since we're not in the lambda calculus formulation like the last paper, what's this saying? So it says, if you have a function that takes as input two things, right? T times T prime, you can curry that and get back out a function from one thing into the function type you know, T prime arrow, T double prime, right? What we have over here. So this, this is the curry operation uh, that corresponds to the lambda in Grust's examples. Does that answer your question? Uh, roughly, yeah, thanks. Okay, cool. And then, right, of course, the, there's the corresponding eval operator, right? Uh, given a function and a, an argument, how do you, how do you evaluate it, um, right? Uh, okay, other questions? Is there a, a connection with strict diagrams or, I mean, they're both Cartesian close, so there must be some representation of each of these with a string diagram also? Ah, uh, good question. Right, so the natural, um, or so, yeah, so what we have here is a bi-Cartesian closed category. And so it can be given a number of graphical reputation, um, graphical, uh, yeah, I'm trying to look for one here. Um, the answer is yes, there is, there is a string diagram notation for use with Cartesian closed categories in particular. Um, you can look at it in tools we have like CQL. Um, it tends to be, or rather um, in, this, in this paper, we're, we're doing everything with a, uh, I guess you'd call product categories, right? Everything is, um, has arity two at most, right? These functions, uh, t plus t, teams times t, what have you. Um, the formalisms tend to get more interesting when you allow uh, multiple er uh, arity arguments, like a co-product of any number of, of types or product of any number of types. And those, those string diagrams uh, correspond to things called operads and, and look really pretty. But um, yeah, as a Cartesian closed category, we can use all of that existing machinery for uh, for displaying them, although me personally, I, I like the symbols, so I don't tend to use them that much. Uh, good question, though. Other questions? Okay, cool. So um, I was actually just intending to to stop there. Right, one hour on any given topic is is a lot, um, especially that since these are uh, not slides, they're um, actual papers, but um, yeah. So I think what I'll do is this, I will stick around to answer questions or uh, hang out with anyone who, who wants to talk category theory. But um, I, yeah, I think we covered the, the majority of the, the content. Hopefully people came away with some idea of, uh, you know, folds and uh, query and the uh, comprehensions and their connection with uh, category theory. And with that, I'll stop the share. Ryan, is this paper available already or is it a draft? Uh, it's a draft. It's actually something that uh, I produced working with Marco. I was thinking I was gonna drop MMADT on top of it, uh, but I, I can send it over to you or post it online. It's at this point, it's just, yeah, not really research anymore. Just a definition of categorical machine language. Cool. Yeah, I'd be interested. It, it should also look a lot like the, I think I copied some of it out of the appendix of the APG paper, so it probably looks familiar for that reason. 
other question? Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd appreciate a copy shared with me as well. Possible. Okay. I'll, uh, I'll post it on the, the meetup itself, I guess. Um, people can, can find it there. Great, thank cool. you. Sure. Are there questions? Is there a paper that would connect it to a string diagram or string diagrams? Uh, so, so is your interest in how Cartesian closed categories in particular have their own specialized string diagrams or just like I want to learn about how string diagrams are different from say commutative diagrams? The question is, um, are there examples of string diagrams that can be represented in the way that you just represented it, things categorically with the type um, equations? Does that make sense? Oh, you, you mean like string diagrams in the sense of say physics or uh, do you mean, so string diagrams, it has a technical meaning in category theory as like an alternative to what are called commutative diagrams. So a commutative diagram, actually I can bring this up. Um, uh, yeah, so, a second. Now if, let me restate it. If we, if you go to your paper and you, you take any one of those, uh, um, I'll call them, statements represent that statement with a string diagram oh yes um so there's a general phenomenon in category theory that a, a commutative diagram is just an abbreviation of a collection of equations right so um, any collection of equations that you can write down in a category theory induces a, a, a commutative diagram and vice versa right a commutative diagram is nothing but an abbreviation for an equation. So for example, this is a commutative diagram. Um, F G, or ignore this thing in the middle. This would be a commutative diagram, right? F goes to G goes to H composed is the same as K to L composed. Um, so that that's, yeah, those have a direct meaning as a, um, equations and commutative diagrams. What I thought you're asking about is something called a string diagram, which is a different style of commutative diagram that uses like a different number of dimensions to represent it, but it's fundamentally the same. Um, so were you, yeah, was your question about uh, string diagrams in this sense, or just like commutative diagrams in this sense, or like- On the right. Entirely? Ah, this thing on the right. Um, I do not know if there are any particular specializations of string diagram notation to Cartesian closed categories in particular. Uh, that's a good question to ask though. There's probably a, like it, it is, yeah, certainly a legitimate question. But I don't know the answer. Okay, thank you. Sure. Uh, other questions? Okay. Um, yeah, and then uh, yeah, thanks everyone for attending. I know it was a bit of a rough lecture, given from you know uh, no preparation, just uh, a paper rather than notes. But I appreciate everyone. Uh, coming by. Um, cool. Thank you very uh, much. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks for putting in the time. Yeah, my pleasure. I really appreciate it. Uh, Lynn, you didn't go with your uh, Hogwarts style book background. Just the, the sunglasses and the cool shirt. Actually, I have another potential question, if you don't mind. Oh, sure. Um, so when you look at something like Cock or Agda or Dress, right, a lot of them involve um, totality checking when it comes to uh, writing primitive recursive functions, especially at the type level, because they're trying to get to ensure that they're terminating. Um, uh, they're trying to ensure that they can be translated to catamorphisms. 
that's actually literally the technical connection. Exactly. You can trans yep. <laughs> and so what I was actually wondering about is uh, whether or not rather than trying to perform uh, if you're aware of any literature where rather than actually starting with uh, effectively what's general recursion and trying to prove that it's uh, primitive, if there's any either existing languages or existing um, even papers that actually try to base um, these high level type systems around the ideas of the different sure. morphisms so that they are actually provably um, primitive recursive from the start, right? Yes. And then, so rather than basing on the Y combinator, you base them on uh, these restrictive notions and then effectively only leave the... Those languages exist. Uh, yeah. They're uh, near and dear to my heart having constructed some of them. So mm -hmm. uh, one such language is called Charity. Uh, I guess it would be the first. It came out in the 90s and it, it's basically camel, right? It's fold okay. and unfold. Um, okay. So you'll see the same language over and over. Um, the, there's a reason that in Koch, for example, they use the restriction and termination, which is that in a dependently typesetting, uh, like writing dependent typed folds, it, it like it, it's beyond hard. That there mm -hmm. are practical considerations that programming in the fold based style is too hard. And when you add dependent types, it becomes basically impossible. Okay. And so even when you can, or rather, I've never seen a system that actually translates into folds that is also dependently typed. They always just do totality checking. Um, yeah. Okay. Cool. So is the, in charity, I'm just tr trying to pull it up, is um, are the different, you know, anakata, et cetera, morphisms, are they basically uh, elementary building blocks in the language or exactly okay cool. it, yeah, does it say, have a does it have an uh, unconstrained unconstrained y combinator no uh, for the okay uh, it's uh, literally camel uh, yeah okay. okay so it's it's not Turing complete even at non compile time basically right I mean even cock won't be right like you can't have uh, right yeah I, I mean, I'm not talking about just theorem provers. I'm sort of thinking about something more akin to Idris, which effectively is trying to be more of a programming language than a theorem prover, right? Mm -hmm. And I guess you want Got general it. recursion when you need it. How's that? Fair, although in a collection processing, it's more like if we want, in, in it, I will counter that with most uses of general recursion are probably actually unfolds and have to do with code data and, you know, unfold and all of that stuff that, you know, if you're using general recur, like, um, but uh, yeah, that, that's a, that, that's a, a point of view, but yeah, at mm -hmm. least in charity and the languages around it, they're all deliberately designed not to be Turing complete. Okay. And to stick to folds. So it handles, infinite data as streams and co-data and co-recursion, basically. Right. Okay. Cool. I'll definitely look this up. Thanks for the reference. Yeah, sure thing. Cool. Uh, anyone else? Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, sure thing. Good to see you. Uh, yep. Yeah, thanks, thanks for again. popularizing that. And thank you. Cool. All right. I guess, cool. uh, yeah, let's call it for real this time. Yep. Cheers. Uh, Take care. All right. Is the See recording you. going to be up? Um, uh, as soon as Zoom, days? yeah, I mean, it, it, Zoom has to like do its thing, but I'll, you know, I'll post it as soon as it's up there and put it in the comment along with the links for the papers from today. Great. Thank you. Cool. All right. Thanks, everyone.